thanks for coming tonight, especially on such a gorgeous Las Vegas evening, uh, for what is our last public lecture of the semester already. So, as always, we save the best for last, and delighted to have John Page here, and uh, since it's the last lecture, he's going to tackle an entire continent for us tonight. Uh, well, a continent that's growing more complex and interesting almost on a daily basis. Uh, I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. So uh, I will just give a brief introduction to our speaker and, and we'll get on to the reason you're all here. Let me not forget to add, for those of you who might be taking notes, we'll have, we actually already have John's PowerPoint up on our website, so don't uh, give yourself carpal tunnel syndrome if you don't need to, they'll be there to refer to. Uh, we are thrilled to have John Page here. John's a senior fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings. He's also director of the International Growth Center at the London School of Economics. And before coming to Brookings, John enjoyed a distinguished career at the World Bank. Uh, he also is a, was a member of the faculties at Stanford and Princeton. He's a research associate in the Center for the Study of African Economies at Oxford. He's been a consultant to the African Development Bank, the Global Development Network, and many other organizations. He obtained his bachelor's degree in economics from Stanford and his doctorate from Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. As you might expect from someone with that litany of accomplishments, he's a well-published, well-respected, well-read colleague. I had a chance to hear a little preview of this lecture, so I know uh, that we're going to be both entertained and informed tonight. And I will turn the stage over to John. Thank you. And, uh, I think far enough west I can actually lose the jacket. You know, in Washington, people don't take you seriously if you don't wear a jacket. They take you even less seriously if you don't wear a tie. I haven't worn a tie since 2008. I'm really doing well. Um, Chris Pissaritis, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, once said in a conversation that we were having that there are very few things in economics that are actually universally true and relevant. Um, one of those is the concept of opportunity cost, which for those of you who aren't economists, is the notion that you've had to give up something to be doing what you're doing. What you're all giving up, of course, are the NCAA basketball championships. So I am deeply grateful for everyone in the room being here. The opportunity cost, at least for some basketball fans, I suspect is pretty high. When I first started working on Africa, which was a very long time ago, we were all actually quite optimistic. It was the immediate post-independence period. Africa's economies were growing well. In fact, Africa uh, looked like one of the winners of the global economy. We then passed into almost 25 years of Africa as, to use the economist term, a lost continent. Beginning in about 1995, things started to turn around. And by 2005, 2010, people were really beginning to say, hey, maybe there's something going on here. And even the economist, very exceptionally for the economist, actually reversed itself and started talking about a hopeful place, uh, a new frontier market. And um, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic. It's actually the fastest growing region of the world right now, not in per capita income terms, but in gross terms. There's a growing African middle class. And uh, the region has grown more than 5% per year for the past 15 years. That's faster than the advanced economies. It also kind of sailed through the economic crisis of 2007-2008. But a predecessor of mine is fond of reminding those of us who've worked on Africa, especially former chief economist for Africa of the World Bank, that over the period of the last 20 years, at least four of us have written books describing Africa's turning point. And I just put them up here for your uh, sort of entertainment. The first one in 1989, where actually the World Bank and the UNDP got together, that's a very rare event, and predicted good things would happen in Africa as a result of economic adjustment. Another book in 1994 on reforms results in the roads ahead. My immediate predecessor in the World Bank, Alan Gelb, asked the question, can Africa claim the 21st century? And then there was this guy by the name of John Page who said, Africa at a turning point? Notice the question mark. I was hedging my bets, as oftentimes economists do. 
And the reason why I was hedging my bets is that there are some continuing worrying signs across the continent. And to my mind, at least, the deepest worry is that the sources of economic recovery in Africa have been good things, but I don't know whether they're sustainable things. The first is fewer economic mistakes. And this is really quite good news. The Africa of the 1980s and 1990s was characterized by governments that simply mismanaged the economy in an incredibly poor way. By about 1995, African governments were beginning to get it. And indeed, by 2007, 2008, 2009, as we hit the global financial crisis, if I were sitting in the IMF or the World Bank, I would have been patting myself on the back because the way in which Africa's economies managed those crises was actually exceptionally good for low-income countries worldwide. What happened then, of course, is that economies that had been operating really well below their potential capacity started to recover. But that only works so long as you're actually getting back to where you were. And the question is, how much more can they do, given that those economic mistakes have now kind of washed out of the system? Happily, at about the same time, there was a commodity boom. And the commodity boom, of course, also assisted African economies to continue to grow. As we'll see, there were also new commodity discoveries and new natural resources discoveries. But you'll notice that all of these things are, in a sense, one-off events. And as a consequence of that, I think, and we'll talk a lot about that as we go through this, we've seen some other worrying signs, which is that while poverty's fallen in Africa, as we move into what my colleagues at Brookings call the last mile, that last stretch of poverty reduction to eliminate the absolute poor, people living on less than $1.25 a day by 2030, the pace of poverty reduction in Africa is much slower than it is in the rest of the developing world. Indeed, if you do the econometrics of it, what you find is that the elasticity, the responsiveness of poverty to growth, is lower in Africa than it is everywhere else. And we don't really know why. We can look for some of the usual suspects and talk about that in questions and answers, but it remains something of a puzzle. Poverty simply isn't falling at the same rate as in other parts of the developing world. And something that we need to keep reminding ourselves, Africa remains very poor. Even in comparison with South Asia, which is the other great regional laggard of the global economy, as you can see, since 1960, 50 years of economic growth and economic decline in Africa have resulted in an extremely low level of per capita income, and one that's remained quite stable. So keep in mind that these high growth rates that we see, and things that excite investors, may not be translating into jobs, they may not be translating into reduced poverty. They may not be felt by African citizens on the street. And one increasingly hears this. So what I thought I'd try to do today is do some extreme simplification. One of my former bosses, Callisto Madavo at the World Bank, used to remind me, and it was usually rather sternly, uh, because economists have this tendency to paint with a broad brush, John, Africa is not a country. In fact, it's 54 or 55 countries, depending on how you count it. Every country is different. Every country faces unique challenges. But there are some interesting cross-cutting themes that come out of this story, and I want to talk about three of them. And I've just, for want of a better term for it, called them three African futures. The first of those futures is an African spring. For those of you who've been following the news, the parallels to the Arab Spring might come immediately to mind. The second of these is something I call Nigeria big time. And I want to talk a little bit about the role of natural resources in Africa's development and the question of management of natural resources for growth. And finally, leopards and laggards, a scenario in which we start to see an increasingly diverse performance across countries among these 55 with varying degrees of success and failure, something that's been quite different from the Africa of the 1970s, 1980s, and even into the early 1990s, where people talked about it, a hopeless continent. I think we're going to actually see a whole range of new and different and exciting economic developments. Well, the African Spring begins with a proposition that we're really just, I think, beginning to understand, and thanks to some very, very good work that's been done by my colleagues at the African Development Bank. And that is that too many people are chasing too few jobs in Africa. 
About 10 to 12 million young people will enter the labor market in Africa every year across the next 10 to 15 years. Those people will be looking for decent work, for good jobs. They'll be looking for jobs that pay living wages, that offer some potential for training, and that offer some security of tenure, some security of employment. What we're finding, which is very, very worrying, is that the very most successful economies in Africa, the folks that are down here on this side of this chart, are the ones that have the lowest responsiveness of employment to economic growth. They're creating the fewest jobs despite the fact that they're growing the fastest. That is a worry because what that means is that people looking for work have to go somewhere. And they go one of two places. In the north of Africa, think the Arab Spring, they go into open unemployment. So you have very high youth unemployment, very high open unemployment, a large formal sector of the economy, but a lot of people looking for work. Interestingly, the mirror image is in the very south, the same thing happens. In South Africa, Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland, you have large formal sectors, a lot of people looking for work, a very high unemployment rate. But in the middle of the continent, what you have, look up the upper left-hand corner of that graphic, is very low registered unemployment, as measured by the International Labor Organization definition. People seeking work actively but not finding work, okay? But very, very high levels of informal employment. And what that means is that people are looking for good jobs, but they're not finding them. But because they are poor, they can't afford simply to sit and wait for something to happen. So where do they end up? They end up in agriculture, in family employment, in other kinds of informal activities, and even in the stereotypical low-end services activities that we sometimes see in National Geographic specials or in CNN specials. Folks sitting essentially in a market or on the side of the road selling a box of chicolates. The trouble with that is that people there are working hard but working poor. It's not that Africans aren't working. It's that the things that they're working at have such low productivity, such low output per worker, that they don't have the opportunity to offer good wages. According to the ILO, about three out of four jobs in sub-Saharan Africa are vulnerable. That's that set of jobs over here in the blue band, the green band, and to some extent in the red band. These are jobs that have such low productivity and such vulnerability of employment that you don't know really from one day to the next whether you're going to remain in the job and you're not quite sure from one day to the next whether or not your earnings are actually going to cover your daily expenses. About 80% of African workers are considered to be working poor. They're actually below the poverty line but still working compared with about 40% of workers worldwide. And in a stunning parallel with the Middle East and North Africa, less than one out of five young workers in Africa finds employment in a formal sector job four out of five new labor force entrants end up doing essentially what their parents were doing, working in the informal sector. To my mind, and that's why I call it the African Spring, the parallels with the Middle East, in particular with Egypt, with Tunisia, and with Libya, and now Syria, are unmistakable. I should tell you that I'm the only person who has ever been the continent's single chief economist. I was both the chief economist for the Middle East and North Africa, and the chief economist for Africa south of the Sahara at two different points in my career in the World Bank. So I kind of span the continent in worrying about these things, and I wish I could be less worried about one part than the other, but unfortunately, it's not the case. Oops, now, come on, I need to go back. Oh, I know what happened. I hope we can get this. This is the trouble with higher technology. It's an animated slide. And I need to go back to one slide before. Oop. Okay, there we go. I finally got it. The trouble is that in contrast with North Africa, and in contrast really with South Africa, for the middle of the continent, I'm not sure that we can find the solution to the employment problem using labor market policies. 
the kinds of things that people even like me recommended for the Egyptian government or the Tunisian government, the South African government, are things like matching young workers to jobs, subsidizing job training, having active labor market policies that try to put people into the labor force and make it more attractive for employers to employ them. To some extent, getting rid of some kinds of labor force regulations that impede hiring or keep people from hiring as many workers as they would like. The trouble is that in the bulk of the continent, that's not the issue. As Gary Fields points out in a very interesting book, which is called Working Hard and Working Poor, those kind of policies work great if you actually have jobs to find. But if you don't have jobs to find, then what you're doing is condemning people to further frustration by equipping them for jobs that simply don't exist. In the case of the middle of the continent, in the case of between North and South, the key issue is that domestic private investment has been the same since the 1990s. It quite simply hasn't been increasing. As you can see, it's about 10, 11% of GDP. Compare that with East Asia, which is in a sense the growth and employment success story of the world economy. It's about half of what we've seen there, especially during the periods when structural change was really moving along at a good clip. What that means is that the employment crisis for the Africa Spring economies is really an investment crisis. It's getting investors to get interested in Africa and getting them to invest in labor-intensive, high-value-added type activities. Unfortunately, and the economist was just reminding us last week about this, I guess now that they've become optimists, they want to sound a cautionary note, Africa still remains a high-cost, high-risk place in which to do business. Very detailed factory floor studies, where you actually go in and measure the physical outputs that workers produce, you measure the value of those outputs, and you make comparisons between plants in various countries, tell us a very interesting fact. For making a standard low-end industrial product like the shirt I'm wearing, or even more so the t-shirt I'm wearing, factory floor costs in Africa are approximately the same as they are in China and India. Where Africa loses out big time is as soon as you walk out of the factory gate. Electrical power is variable, doesn't often work. It's costly to replace the public grid with your own generators. The ports are slow and inefficient. The road infrastructure is deficient. And it's very difficult, oftentimes, to do business with the government. So, it's caused many of us over the years, and particularly those of us in the aid industry, to look at something that Nick Stern calls the investment climate. It's the physical and institutional investment environment within which you operate. And so the first order of business in trying to get toward the African Spring, or at least to avoid the African Spring, is to fix the investment climate. And the only point I would make here is that historically, Economists, including myself, have spent far more time on the regulatory and institutional aspects of the investment climate than we have on two important physical aspects of the investment climate. And the problem is that I'm not sure we've identified yet which regulations, which institutions really keep investors from wanting to invest because when you look at a country like Vietnam and you look at the extent of regulation, and you look at the extent of institutional inefficiency, and yet you look at the rate of investment, you say, well, institutions can't be the whole story. And maybe we haven't got the right institutions right. Somehow the Vietnamese have managed to work around some of their problems. But two things that really bite are infrastructure and skills. On every evaluation of infrastructure, Africa ranks 20 percentage points below the rest of the world in terms of the infrastructure that's available if you're an investor. It's especially bad in two areas that are absolutely critical if you want to compete globally, electrical power and transport. Closing that infrastructure gap is an enormous fiscal drain. It's going to cost about $93 billion to bring African infrastructure up to the kind of minimum standard level we would expect for low-income countries over a period of about 10 years. It's $9 billion a year. I'll just leave it to you for a moment or two to think about where can that money come from? Because that is a great deal of money either to ask the aid business or to ask individual African governments to put on the table. Beyond that, there's also a skill story, which is one of these kind of ironies. 
The Millennium Development Goals, which were introduced to eradicate poverty and improve human development, include a very important goal, which is 100% primary school enrollment. Africa has done very well in getting toward 100% primary school enrollment. But because money is limited, it's involved a trade-off. And the trade-off is that quality has declined at every level of education in Africa, and that access to secondary education, university education, and skills training has also been limited. Not too important right now, because as we've seen, there isn't a dynamic private sector that's growing. But if we get the investment climate right in the other respects, with respect to regulations and with respect to infrastructure, then suddenly skills may start to be a constraint. And the trouble with skills is educational reforms that you begin today only pay off 15 to 20 years later when those children enter the labor force. So we've focused a great deal and with good success in terms of primary education, but we've kind of thrown the educational baby out with the bathwater because we haven't thought very seriously about what happens when you need people who are secondary graduates or tertiary graduates. Let me turn to the next future, if you will, and that's Nigeria big time. One of the things that is both a marvel and a worry for people who've spent as long as I have looking at Africa, is that already we know that Africa has about 30% of the world's mineral reserves. But Africa is almost completely unexplored. At least half the continent has never had any geological mapping, has never had any geological surveys. Paul Collier, who's become famous in dealing with questions of natural resources, likes to point out that virtually all of the exploration in Africa has taken place within one mile on either side of the colonial railways or the colonial roads. So it gives you an idea of how little of the continent's actually been looked at seriously by minerals and geology uh, and other companies. But what we're finding is that new discoveries are really taking place every day. Five years ago, the countries that I've listed up there, those five countries, were considered to be diversified, low-income African countries with no natural resources and really no resource potential. In this five-year period, Ghana, Kenya, and Uganda have found oil. Mozambique and Tanzania are sitting on natural gas reserves that are as big as the state of Qatar. So suddenly natural resources come into play in countries that really never had to deal with them before. And the reason why I'm worried is that this is an enormous opportunity. It gives you the opportunity if you're a government to translate the natural resource wealth into other forms of economic growth. But it's one that's accompanied by huge risks. And the reason why I'm being mean to the Nigerians is the following. Ah, now I can't get my animation to go. Ah, oil revenues per person in Nigeria started at about $30 a person in 1965. Today, they're over $300 a person. Remember this poverty headcount thing, absolute poverty is about a dollar a day. If the Nigerian government wanted to completely eliminate poverty, it could hand out a check to every Nigerian citizen for just the oil revenues per person, and it would have zero poverty, essentially. But this is a stunning, if I can get it to come up. Ah, whoop. Income per person has been the same in Nigeria since 1960. Where's it all gone? Through a combination of corruption, mismanagement, and just simply poor economic choices, <coughs> Nigeria has completely wasted nearly 50 years of petroleum revenues. You can imagine what economic policymakers in Tanzania or Uganda or Kenya are saying today, and I'm very pleased that they're saying it, which is, we really don't want that to happen to us. We need to think about how we change the way in which we do business as resource-rich economies in order to avoid this. I think I may have to go back and use the clicker. Nigeria is not alone. Across the continent, Angola, Equatorial Guinea, others, this is the track record. More income inequality, less spending on health care, more child malnutrition, lower literacy, the non-oil economies at the same level of income. Okay? 
And not too surprisingly, this then has become something that we call the resource curse. And what's also interesting about it is that it's not unique to Africa. It happens across the world in resource-rich economies. There is a cottage industry of economists who have done econometric research and other kinds of case study research looking at the resource curse. It's something that we consider to be very real and very worrisome. There are a number of different explanations for it. And to save time, I'm not going to speak too much about any of them, but let me just give you a headliner on each one. Dutch disease is our shorthand as economists for the fact that a resource-rich economy tends to produce too few of other goods that are growth enhancing. Those types of goods are usually traded, industrial or services activities, oftentimes exportables. Given the structure of incentives in a resource-rich economy, those types of activities are discouraged relative to places like construction, domestic services, and other kinds of national services activities. Volatility, well, at least the history of resource-rich economies has been, is to spend when times are good and spend when times are bad, but not to save. And so the spending when times were bad was usually from the accumulation of debt, and once the debt could no longer be paid, you had a debt crisis and an economic collapse. It was the story of the 1970s commodity booms in Africa. Bad institutions, and here I'll be the first to admit that as economists, we're not very good with this because we don't really, I think, understand where the chicken is and where the egg is. We know that countries that start out with poor institutions and discover natural resources have a very poor track record of being able to use them well. But there's also a literature that suggests that the more natural resources you find, the more it undermines your institutions. So it may well be that there's some minimum threshold of institutional capacity or integrity or some set of factors of government or governance that are critical if you're going to be successful in managing natural resources. Above that, you can get a virtuous cycle going. Below that, it may turn out to be a vicious cycle. But where we draw that threshold is really hard to find. And of course, two of the major culprits in the institutional game are corruption and conflict. The presence of natural resources and the great concentration, particularly of what we call point source natural resources, things like blood diamonds, is a very strong source of conflict and of corruption, which undermines other accountability structures in the society. But there's some good news here. Geology actually isn't destiny. Everywhere else in the world, and it's fun, funny to say this here in Nevada, because Nevada is a perfect example of the exception to the rule, but except for the United States, every other country in the world declares that anything that's under the ground belongs to the nation. We're the only country in the world in which if I own a piece of property and there's an oil field underneath my piece of property, I own the oil. What that means is that if you're a natural resources exporter, big government is in a sense inevitable. You're going to be the custodian of the nation for these resources, small or vast, you have to start making decisions and you have to make good decisions or you're going to end up Nigeria big time. As you can see here, the track record of a couple of places in Asia is really quite good. This is a handy dandy piece of economic technology that we call a growth incidence curve. And it comes from the study of poverty and it's a very nice thing because it both lets us look at growth and income distribution more or less at the same time. What I've done here is just split these three economies up into three big groups of people. The bottom 40%, the middle 40%, and the top 20%. What you can see is that in the case of Nigeria, the only people who did well out of almost 20 years of the oil boom, uh, from 1995 to 2014, were the people in the top 20%. And the average of those three groups, of course, is why we haven't seen any per capita income growing in Nigeria. But if you look at the patterns for Malaysia and Indonesia, they actually are quite the reverse. There's been a pattern of pro-poor growth going on in these economies, and that's not an accident. That's the consequence of the fact that governments in Malaysia and Indonesia made a set of very conscious choices about what to do with natural resources and with the revenues from natural resources in the pursuit of what they called a shared growth strategy. The problem 
for African economies that confront a new natural resources boom is that you have to make a lot of decisions. And those decisions basically break down into at least five big ones. How do I find a resource? Who do I get to extract the resource and what kind of a deal do I do with them? How do I collect the revenues? And how do people in my own society know the revenues that I'm collecting? Do I save the money? Do I spend the money? And then where do I spend the money? And we don't really have time because I don't want to take up all the space today without questions to talk about each one of these, but let me just make a couple of points. The first one is that for every African country, realistically speaking, except for South Africa, the entity that finds and extracts the resource is going to be a foreign investor. It may be a Chinese foreign investor, it may be a Western foreign investor, but it will be a foreign investor. So dealing with the foreign investor and getting a fair deal for both sides is extremely important and we haven't had a good track record of doing that. Collecting revenues is important, but people knowing what the revenues are is also important. So transparency in revenue collection is very important because how can I hold a government accountable for what it spends or doesn't spend if I don't know actually how much revenue we collected from the natural resource company in the first place? Happily, there is an initiative globally called the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative launched by the UK government, but now basically subscribed to by about 50 countries around the world and most of the major Western extractive industries, which takes as its first principle, publish what you pay. So if I'm Tello Oil and I have a concession to extract oil from Uganda, which Tello indeed does, as a subscriber to the EITI, both Uganda and Tello will agree to publish what it is Tello's paying. And that, of course, allows for much greater public scrutiny of what's done with those resources. Because part of the problem in Nigeria was since nobody know how, knew how much money was coming in, they had absolutely no idea how much money was going out to places like Switzerland and the Cayman Islands. A really important issue is that if you make a bad decision anywhere along this chain, you can derail the process. And that is maybe part of the insight into why having a certain minimum threshold of institutional capacity is important. Let me just give you a simple example. We always tend to focus, we being at least the economists who deal with these kinds of issues in Africa, on the sort of upper end of the chain, finding the resource, getting a good deal, being transparent. But you can have an excellent extraction agreement, an excellent revenue agreement, a completely transparent flow of money into the treasury. And if the treasury makes bad investments decisions with the money, you can have as disastrous an outcome as if you knew nothing about what was going on. So it's quite important to make sure that all of these decisions actually work together with each other. And that requires something which is tough and I think is going to be a major challenge for African economies, which is a minimum standard of accountability and transparency. Again here, I think the good news is that Africa is moving in that direction. The worry is, is it moving in that direction fast enough? Some thoughts about what to do with the money. Agriculture is critical in Africa. One of the keys to that shared growth pattern that I showed you in both Malaysia and Indonesia was large investments in rural infrastructure and in agricultural productivity. We haven't seen that in part because the aid industry lost interest in agricultural productivity in Africa about 15 to 20 years ago. The resources in countries like Mozambique and Tanzania, which still have 65 to 70 percent of their populations living and working in rural areas, in agricultural technology and agricultural productivity could be very important in terms of paying off in the livelihoods of citizens. One thing to keep in mind is that a gas field or an oil well doesn't generate very many jobs. So coming back to the theme of the African Spring, as a government, you've got to be thinking about where do I bring good jobs to the people who are already working? Part of that is raising productivity on African farms. Improving competitiveness, I talked very little about, but a bit about the Dutch disease. You can actually offset the Dutch disease, but to do so means going back to that investment climate story and putting more money into infrastructure and skills. But again, governments need to A, have done a good job in that decision chain in order to have the resources to put in, and B, they need to be very, very careful about where they spend their money 
Trade-related infrastructure is very important in Africa because it connects you to the rest of the world, and Africa, unfortunately, is deficient in virtually every aspect of its trade-related infrastructure. And finally, something you can do because you hold the cards vis-a-vis -vis the foreign investor, and that is to leverage value chain relationships with foreign investors to try to get them to transact more business with your domestic firms. This is not something that's simple because every time people have tried a simple solution, like a domestic content requirement, you must spend 20% of your sourcing on domestic contractors, it hasn't worked. This really means getting people around the table, Bud's term is public-private partnerships, but getting people actively engaged to say, where are the capabilities in this economy, where can they be strengthened, and how do we make it attractive to the foreign investor to become part of a value chain process that increases the cap capabilities of our own firms. Leopards and laggards. I spent a lot of my mid-career in the World Bank working on East Asia. And one of the things you can't escape when you work on East Asia is the fact that economic progress in East Asia has been characterized by what the Asians themselves call the flying geese. First Japan, then the Four Tigers. Now we have um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand. Vietnam is emerging. Now people are talking about perhaps Myanmar or Burma. So what I think we're going to see in Africa in the next 15 years is a group of African high performers emerge. And those high performers will be countries that have gone through a process of structural economic change that thus far has not taken place in Africa. And those that succeed in doing that will be the leopards. Those that fail in doing that will be the laggards. Why is this structural change stuff important? Because it is the little bit of extra advantage you have as a poor economy. In poor economies, the differences between sectors in terms of output per worker are very, very large. Remember the diagram with a very long, flat green bar with extremely low productivity in agriculture and a very high spike at the end. Advanced economies aren't characterized by that. But in the transition from low income to high income status, reallocation of labor from low productivity to high productivity jobs is really one of the primary engines of growth. And it's a little bit like getting something for nothing. Because we believe that growth essentially has to come from one of two components, accumulation or productivity change, one way to think about it is it's like being on an escalator. If you're in an escalator and you're going up, and you walk up the escalator, you get there faster than the folks who just ride. The walking part is the accumulation, the riding part is productivity change. But what if you make a mistake and you get on the down escalator and you try to go up? You still get there in the end, but you may be so tired by the time you got to the top that you wonder whether or not the trip was really worth it. That's the kind of offsetting part of having productivity change work counter to the accumulation process in economic growth. And the worry in Africa is that for about the last 20 years, that's exactly what's been going on. Africa has been going up the down escalator. Within sector productivity has been going up, but as a share of the labor force, workers have been moving into lower and lower productivity employment. That's the counterpart to the African spring of increasing informality and increasingly vulnerable employment. It has its expression also in a failure to create good jobs and in a reduction in the overall rate of growth. Bottom line is Africa needs industry and it doesn't have it and it's been losing it. And the question is, how then can Africa get it? And can the leopards be part of a process that sets them apart from other African economies in being somewhat more successful in breaking into the global market? There's another good news story here, I think. Today, one thing we know for a fact is that anyone who aspires to get into the global market for industry is competing with Asia. And they're competing specifically with China. But we know that costs in China are rising. There's growing domestic demand in Asia. And even the Chinese authorities themselves are asking the question, shouldn't we be offshoring some of these really quite simple manufacturing processes that we were good at 10, 15, 20 years ago, but are becoming really too costly to be competitive. The leopards will be the ones that manage to find a way to do that. 
And I think there's another little piece of good news here, which is that in contrast with the world in which I grew up, where if you talked about industry, you really talked about individual industrial products that were traded across countries. It could be iron and steel, but it could be cars, it could be electronics. Today we're talking about industries that don't need smokestacks anymore. Tradable services activities. I was talking with Bill Brown today about this earlier. Do you know that Las Vegas is one of the largest exporters of traded services in the United States? Why? Because your gaming moguls own casinos in Macau. And that registers as a traded activity. They use their technical expertise in running a casino to make money, which comes back to the U.S. as an industrial activity. It's not unique. Think of call centers. Think of any of the other of these kind of remote, impersonal services that oftentimes take place. The other huge area of potential for Africa is tourism. Africa not only has leopards, it has cheetahs, and it has elephants, and it has rhinos, and there is almost no place else in the world that can offer such a diversity of tourist attractions as the African continent. That's another potentially huge source of employment and of growth and of structural change. And it's the leopards that will somehow manage to figure out how to do this. To do it, you have to do three things, and it's kind of like my natural resources story, you've got to do them pretty well. The first thing is you've got to get into this business of trade and tasks. What trade and task means is that in contrast with the old days when we made a single product in a single country and sent it somewhere, and for those of you who suffered through any kind of international trade class, you know that that's the model that we all at least learned and taught many years ago. Today you basically take an individual slab of the production process. It can be design, it can be basic manufacturing, it can be assembly, it can be marketing, and you job that out to a whole host of countries. And you move the components back and forth. This is the story of Asia's success in manufacturing, trade and tasks. It's a chance to get a foothold for low-income countries because you can start with the very simple task, like putting the components onto the motherboard. But it doesn't guarantee you're going to be successful. And one of the fundamental facts is that there have been very few African countries that have had any success in trade and tasks. One of the reasons is that we know that companies like to group together, firms like to group together. And the reason for that is they actually get an increase in productivity that comes from the ability to observe others and knowledge. I mean, one way to think about this is think about Silicon Valley. Why is Silicon Valley there? It's there because it attracts individual firms and entrepreneurs to come into an environment in which they learn and in which knowledge is shared and in which their productivity is improved. This is a kind of collective action problem, to use the economics term, because if you're Africa, the few firms that you have have a harder time competing against Asia's agglomerations. And it's much harder to get firms to come in because unless you get a group of firms to move, nobody wants to move individually. So it takes some public policy to figure out how we actually make the place attractive for industrial agglomerations. And finally, this idea of capabilities. And here I feel a little humble always when I mention it because, you know, economists are funny people. It, probably at this university we have a management school and we have an economics department. I think, in fact, even the economics department sits within the management school. But probably the guys who do management and the guys who do economics don't talk to each other very much. Economists usually think about the firm as a black box. And what we're interested in doing is we're interested in tinkering around with the incentives around the black box. And we want to see which way it moves. Management people are interested in what's inside the black box. And a kind of newly rediscovered field of development economics called firm capabilities says let's open up the black box because it turns out that the software of how firms operate has an important role in explaining productivity differences across countries. So the better software you have, the better management you have, the better work practices you have, the more tacit knowledge you have in your labor force, the better off you are. Getting that tacit knowledge doesn't come for free. So you've actually got to do the hard work that people in management schools do to figure out what it is that you need. But it's the high capability firms that are the ones that are actually able to compete globally. So the leopards are going to need to do three things. They're going to need to push exports, which means having, in a sense, an incentive structure that makes it more attractive to export than to do other kinds of activities. They're going to need some spatial industrial policies to put a kind of fancy term on it. But essentially, they need to begin with something like a special economic zone, which has been very successful in Asia. 
And they're going to need a set of activities to attract and build firm capabilities. And one of the powerful engines of doing this is foreign direct investment. So getting these three things together and doing them well is part of what I think will help the leopards to distinguish themselves from the others. And I think that's going to require a new role for aid. And because I've been in the aid industry for a long time, I want to wrap up with this one. Keep in mind that Africa is the world's most aid dependent region by an order of magnitude. Every African finance minister wakes up every morning knowing that at least 10% of his national budget comes from aid and sometimes it's as much as 60%. So what the aid industry wants to do is very important to what Africa wants to do. And what the aid industry has wanted to do since the mid-1990s is human development, which is great. And we've had enormous achievements. I just chose from a friend of mine who's done quite a bit of work on this uh, in terms of the effectiveness of aid. One slide that shows you under five mortality, which has been one of the objectives of the Millennium Development Goals. What you'll notice is that the rate of improvement in Africa, starting from a much poorer base, has been about the same as everywhere else. And if we were to put up any set of other slides dealing with human development, we'd see essentially the same story. That's the good news. But the bad news is that, if I'm right, the failure to create jobs puts all of that at risk. Because we could have the risk of an African spring. So aid, I think, needs to think in new ways, and sometimes to go back to old practices. One is that we really need to think, in a post-2015 aid agenda, of using aid for job creation. Jobs may need to become a goal. Paul Romer, the famous economic theorist, once very seriously proposed that we should stop measuring economic success and development by growth of GDP, and start measuring it by a criterion of growth of good jobs. How many good jobs are created? That may be a little bit far-reaching, but at the same time, it makes a lot of sense for opening a dialogue. Linking aid to trade. Remember, we talked about an export push and the success of exporters. Unfortunately, trade ministers and aid ministers never talk to each other. And that's true whether it's the United States, the OECD, Japan. I suspect in China it's the same problem. Now, sometimes in political debates, we hear people talk about aid versus trade. Oh, well, we don't need more aid. We need more trade. The fundamental reality is when you look at how well Africa has done at least, when it's been given opportunities to have access to the US and European market, the so-called supply response has been quite dismal because of all the other intervening factors that I was talking about. Lack of infrastructure, lack of skills, a poor investment climate, a lack of a kind of coherent policy orientation toward exports, a lack of agglomerations. Aid can play an important role in that, but only if you get the aid minister and the trade minister talking to each other. And finally, a role which I think is quite important, and that is that donors need to take this issue of Nigeria big time much more seriously than they're currently doing. The sort of prevailing mindset in the aid industry today when a new resource discovery is found is, that's great. Now we can reduce the aid budget to this country and we can take it and put it somewhere else. The trouble with that is you may reduce your engagement as well. And it may be that the country doesn't need the money, but it needs the engagement in these areas such as transparency, accountability, and some decent advice oftentimes on how to deal with the foreign investor and the extractive industry. There's an important set of things here that aid really hasn't come to grips with, I don't think, yet moving forward in Africa. So I think what's going to happen is by 2030, we're going to see a more diverse continent. There are going to be some industrial countries, and there'll be leopards. And this can be industries without smokestacks, successful exporters of tourism and other services. There'll be some resource-rich economies that actually manage to make it. And there'll be a lot of them that don't. And what I hope is that some that were poor performers in the past may actually climb out of that and, and do better. But the economies that don't make the changes I'm talking about, in the case of natural resource exporters, really managing the resource well, in the case of other countries becoming a leopard, are going to end up as the laggards. And the African Spring, I think, will become quite a real and scary prospect to the political elites of those countries, because as we've seen in North Africa, that kind of problem can really undermine the social fabric of a country and leave it devastated, both in economic and political terms. So which future? 
Well, I'm going to prove to you that I'm an economist because I'm going to give you a typically economist answer. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. I hope we have a couple of questions we have some time for, or comments, reactions. Anyone care to start us off, sir? Um, what effects do some of the cultural and social problems that are occurring on a day-to-day basis in Africa having on growth? This is another one of these strange circular issues, I think. Um, I'm not a big believer in cultural explanations for differences in economic performance, and, and I'll tell you a little story as to at least one of the powerful uh, anecdotes as to why. In about 1957, uh, the United States sent a distinguished delegation of economists to East Asia, and they did a survey of the emerging Asian economies and came back and they had their leopards and their laggards, or their tigers and their laggards. Among those that they said were the most hopeless cases was Korea. And so, oh, Korea is hopeless. It has these Confucian values, which means that people don't want to work hard, they're not entrepreneurial, they don't do anything that's going to kind of make them stand out. They have a corrupt and inefficient government and poor institutions. And you know, quite frankly, they have no resources, so there's just no way that they're going to be able to, to develop. Well, of course, we know that that wasn't true. The Koreans were somehow able to change themselves. Um, at the same time, we do know that Africa is the most fractionalized part of the world in terms of, you know, micro-ethnic groups, tribes, what have you. One of the things we do think we know in development is that as you get richer, those kinds of differences become less important. But those kinds of differences can keep you from getting richer. And I think there, this is when the economists have to kind of step back from the center of the stage and say, well, wait a minute, politics matters. I think what we're seeing in Africa is where you've had political leadership that said, we need to build a nation, countries like Tanzania or Ghana, you've seen the ability to kind of get away from that, then you get some economic progress and then it becomes less important. Where politicians have actually played up those differences, like in Nigeria or in Kenya, then you've seen that even though they've got well-functioning economies, it's been hard to kind of keep them going. And so I don't think as an economist we have all the answers to this story, but I do think that the politics of it are important. And I think this idea then of also having some models, of having some countries where as I can look at my near neighbor and see that they're being successful, maybe they're having a way of dealing with these differences, I can insist that my own government, my own political elites address them more straightforwardly. Whereas if we say, well, you know, you can do what Korea did, the answer of most African politicians is Korea's a long way away and they're Koreans. But if it's Uganda and we're looking at Kenya, that's a very different sort of a story, I think. Sir, when you had that, um, that number, like you had like 33, and then you had 300 and something? 327 or something like that, yeah. yeah. Something like that. So you said that that, was, that is what the government can give to each person in Nigeria, right? That's oil revenues per person. Right. And and what it is now. So you're saying that they're not getting that because the government is not doing what they're supposed to do. Well, I mean, it's a thought experiment to say they could give it to them, right? About the only place I know of in the world where the government actually hands out the oil revenues to individual citizens is the state of Alaska. So anybody who's thinking about, you know, wanting to get a check, uh, you can go up there and that actually happens. Although I do have some colleagues in Washington who are so seriously proposing this for governments in, in Africa and in other places as well. But the point is, conceptually speaking, in the Treasury there's $327 for every Nigerian citizen. So if they didn't want to spend the money on anything else, they could just write a check to every Nigerian citizen and every Nigerian citizen would be $327 richer. And you're saying that the, um, as far as like all of the resources that they have, that, they're, that Nigeria is sitting on, that there's no one to actually like, get it going for them? Well, I think in Nigeria's case, three things have happened, really. The first is that, boy, I mean, they've had governments that just have stolen big time. I don't know if you've seen the headlines, but they've just uncovered the latest, you know, half a billion dollars worth of stuff that one of the former military dictator's family is still keeping offshore. And that's after they'd already recovered something like 380 million or something on, uh, on that order uh, in Obasanjo's government. So part of it is the crooks just took it. 
They took it out of the country and they used it for their own purposes. The second part is that they went through these kind of cycles of spend and borrow and spend and borrow. Well, when you borrow, you've got to pay back. So in paying back, they had to use new revenues in order to compensate for the fact that they had already spent money they didn't actually, actually have. So that kept them from making new investments in more growth-oriented kinds of things. And then they just made some really bad investment choices. Because of the federalism in, in Nigeria, a large proportion of the money is handed out to the states. And so you had at the national government this problem of corruption and inefficiency. And then you take it down to the states and you have a second problem of corruption and inefficiency. So that's why you know, I kind of titled this section Nigeria big time. If that happens in a lot of other countries, there are going to be a lot of really angry Africans in 25 or 30 years, just as there are a lot of really angry Nigerians today. I mean, finally, for the very first time, we're seeing quite a bit of political support to the current minister, Ngozi Nkonjo Iweala, to clean this up and get it right and get it going for the first time. But there were just a whole set of really bad choices that were made. And what it means is, you see, if you have a depletable resource, like oil or gas, that's a natural asset. All of you have probably heard about green accounting. That's where you put the costs on the ledger side. But you also need to put the assets on the ledger side of national income accounting. And if you're going to take that asset out of the ground, you need to replace it with some other asset that's going to give you a stream of income into the future. If you don't do that, if you bend it in civil service salaries, if you allow people to be corrupt and steal it, that just cuts the basis for growth out from under the economy. So in a sense, every Nigerian can look today and say, you've spent my national patrimony for the last 50 years. Are you going to fix that problem? What are you going to do about it? mid-1995 to 2005 period, there's been able to see economic growth in this country. Is that time span uh, enough to be able to say that there's been economic growth in Africa? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think a, um, we're now up to almost 20 years. Starting in 1995, we go through up to about 2014. You know, a 20 year time span is actually quite a long period of time in, in, in development, believe it or not, okay. to have sustained growth. Um, what we find, in fact, is that generally across the world, we have growth episodes that last six, seven, eight years. And then it's followed either by a period of slower growth or it's followed by a period of economic contraction. There's only one place in the whole world where you've had a kind of successful growth experience for more than 20 years, and that's in, in in a sort of successful East Asian economies. And that's why it's still called the East Asian miracle. I mean, economists are as baffled as anyone else why it is that this subset of economies in East Asia has been so successful in sustaining growth over such a long period of time. But I think it's not unfair for African governments to get a little triumphalist and say, well, hey, guys, you know, remember, we had 25 years when you wrote us off because we weren't growing. Now we've had almost 20 years of growing. We need to be taken seriously, and I think that's true. But I think there is still, as I've tried to emphasize, a lot of concern as to how you manage this transition from a recovery, which is really what happened, into this period of sustained growth, and how you do it in the presence of growing natural resource wealth, which, as we've seen, is not necessarily a good thing. It could be, but it's potentially also really a, a big downside risk. Yeah. Some of the countries that are immersed in conflict, I guess the major country, uh, the largest by population, is, is in ongoing civil war. Civil wars spotted throughout, and then the kleptocracies. So who specifically is doing so well? Well, I think the good news on kleptocracies is the incidence of kleptocracies is much lower today. And, and again, this is part, I think, of why we start to see this growth turn around around 1995. Around 1995, you get a third generation of African political leaders. They're not saints, and many of them are autocrats. But they're also not complete crooks. And that's important. Because in a very simple-minded way, I think about politics in Africa in three phases. A phase in which you had well-meaning 
post-independence leaders who oftentimes made bad economic choices, a period in which you had a bunch of crooks, and now a period in which we seem to have a greater diversity in terms of the political elites, but somewhat better economic choices. So I think on the kleptocracy side, I'm, I'm somewhat more optimistic perhaps than you are, Bernie, that you know, there's, there's some real opportunity here. And the democratic accountabilities are starting to kick in. I mean, you know, we, we're now in uh, third cycle of elections in Ghana, including a very tight and highly contested election, which went peacefully and transitioned power. We're in a fifth cycle of elections in Tanzania. We're now getting out of the swamp, I think, in Kenya. So we've got a bunch of presidents for life who are still hanging around and they'll stay at the party for too long. But they aren't always bad for economic management. I mean, we had a lot of presidents for life in East Asia during the rapid growth period too. It's really more do they feel accountable to their populations and I think the accountability is, is, is growing. On conflict, again, if you look at the numbers, the number of conflicts in Africa has fallen dramatically since the mid-1990s. And this comes back to some arguments that people like Paul Collier make that economic progress and conflict are also related. Conflict is terrible for economic progress, but economic progress can reduce the economic pressure for conflict. But then we bring in the joker in the pack, which is the new discoveries of natural resources because natural resources make conflict, in a sense, more valuable. So it's going to be very interesting to see how that works out. Happily, I think, if one can say that, since most of the new resource discoveries are in East African states that tend to be better governed, at least we're sort of in a better position than we would be if it were a major new natural resources discovery in a place like Liberia or Sierra Leone or, God forbid, in the Central African Republic. But those are going to happen. And when they do, then we're going to have to see how that's managed. One last question, please. Yeah. In recent years, China has been a big investor in African states. And I was wondering, do you think um, the, these investments would act more of an enzyme for the economy growth or more of a dependable aspect? China is a really interesting puzzle. Um, I actually am probably in the sort of, how shall I put it, the pro-Chinese fringe. I think the Chinese bring a couple of very important things to this equation of the new Africa. The first is that they bring a very recent experience of being a low-income country themselves. So as contrasted with the kind of dominant interlocutors the Africans have always faced, the French, the British, the World Bank, these guys can actually legitimately sit down, and they did in the 2006 Africa Economic Summit in Beijing and say, 25 years ago we were where you are now. We think we've got some relevant ideas to share about what you should be doing and we don't necessarily think they're the same ideas that those folks who sit in Washington or in London or in Paris have. And as an economist, I should be very happy to see competition because competition in the world of ideas is just as important as competition in the world of business. So the fact that the Chinese bring something new and a new perspective I think is very, very good. They also bring resources, and they bring expertise in certain areas that the traditional donors have not been interested in. Go back to this idea of industrial zones. It's very hard to find a traditional aid agency in Europe, the United States, or even in the World Bank who's interested in a special economic zone. But the Chinese believe that that was a major part of their economic success, so they've gone around Africa building 10 new zones, putting a lot of effort into it, and recruiting firms to come into those zones. So I think that's very good and very relevant. Two areas of concern. Part of their engagement in Africa, but not all of their engagement in Africa, is resource seeking. So it comes back to the idea of getting a good deal. It's just as bad to sign an intransparent agreement with the Chinese National Petroleum Company, although it may be a state-owned firm, as to sign it with Tello Oil or to sign it with somebody else. has to be all the parties. If you're going to do the EITI, it has to be the companies and the host country government that agree that this is going to happen. And what you want, it's like a seal of good housekeeping, basically. What you want is to be admitted to the EITI as a full member. People who are vote and whether you get to join their club. 
And then what you're required to do is make every company publish what they pay. The Chinese have not wanted to play, so they don't do it. So one of the questions is, are you really getting a good deal if the Chinese build a road or they build a stadium and then you give them a concession on a natural resource? We don't know, so that's a worry. Um, the second worry is, and this is something that's always raised by the OECD governments, and particularly it's always raised by the former colonial powers. Oh, the Chinese don't care anything about governance. They don't have any political conditionality. They don't care about accountability. They'll just do a deal. Well, again, I think competition is a good thing. Um, the other side of that coin, which oftentimes the aid industry doesn't see, is that, and it came very forcefully to me when I was at a meeting with um, President Benjamin Nkapa, the former president of Tanzania, is the degree to which African leaders resent being told what to do by aid donors. And you know, he basically said to me, John, he said, when you used to come to Tanzania, I couldn't tell you what I really thought because I knew I had to be polite for you, with you because you were big cheese in the World Bank. He says, now I can tell you what I really think. You guys are just a bunch of arrogant little snots, is basically what he said. One thing that the Chinese bring to the party is a very different approach. So we got to keep in mind that where you stand depends on where you sit. Um, just to finish up with the story, I was in a panel with Nkapa's successor, actually, President Kikwete, and somebody raised their hand and said, "You know, President Kikwete, what should the kind of OECD countries, what should the rich countries do to help Africa manage the Chinese in Africa?" And he smiled and he said, "Absolutely nothing. Don't touch it." He said, we Africans have to manage the Chinese. He said, I will remind you folks, and this was in uh, Cape Town in South Africa, right? huge crowd of people from all the former colonial countries. I will remind you folks that when you were our colonial powers, you were doing all the same things that you are accusing the Chinese of doing now. He said, we had to learn how to manage you, so we're going to have to learn how to manage them. But it doesn't do us any good if you decide to step in and try to manage the relationship. We want to do it ourselves. We have to be accountable. We have to, have to step up. And I think he was right. So it's not going to be a uniformly happy story. And it's not even a uniform story in the sense that the Chinese always know what they're doing. Some parts of the Chinese government do things that other parts of the Chinese government don't like. But I do think they're important. They're going to be a major actor. And the rest of us are going to have to learn to deal with it, both on the countryside in Africa and on the aid side in the, in the donor community. Thank you, John. Thank you for your attendance, your questions. If you have an unasked question, we'll be around for a few minutes. I don't have a commercial to make for our next lecture since it won't be until September, but stay tuned. We'll be announcing a whole slate of colleagues coming out and speaking on important public policy talks next fall and spring. Enjoy the night.